Welcome to the second day of Brucon. Uh, we'll start with uh, social engineering uh, from Sharon Conhadi. Um, well, why is social engineering important? I don't know if you heard about the biggest diamond heist in Antwerp ever. It wasn't done with armed guards, it wasn't done with explosives, it was done by one guy who walked in, took it, and just got out with diamonds. So, how did he do it? That's why I come Sharon. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. Uh, this guy who uh, robbed the diamond vault in Antwerp, his name supposedly was Carlos Hector Flomenbaum, which I think is a fantastic name for a social engineer. And uh, I might think about changing my name to something that sounds a bit more extravagant, I think. So, uh, first of all, Thanks guys for uh, actually showing up this morning. I appreciate it. it is extremely early on a Saturday morning and I suspect there's some people out there who haven't even been home yet since last night and maybe are still a little bit drunk. So my name is Sharon Conhidi and uh, I am an ethical social engineer, which is a little bit like saying I'm an honest liar, but I really am quite good. Uh, I've been social engineering pretty much all my life, since I was a little kid, making my way into the cinema for free. And I have noticed that social engineering is a trait that has been passed down from mother to daughter within my family for many, many generations. So I've learned an awful lot about my social engineering skills from my mother, who's just fantastic. She knows nothing about computers, but her social engineering skills are superb. So I'm going to talk a bit about my life as a social engineer. I'm a pen tester and uh, mostly do techie stuff by day, but in the past couple of years, particularly, there's been a huge increase in the number of clients looking for social engineering tests. And uh, it's my favorite kind of test to run, especially when you've got an all-out attack, so you can get into a client by whatever means you can find, whether it's social engineering or technical attacks or a combination of the two. So I'm going to explain a little bit about how I run a social engineering test engagement and uh, hopefully give you some ideas on how to run a good ethical social engineering test. So computers are not always easy to break into anymore. Sometimes they are, as many of you guys know, but not always. And sometimes it's easier or it can really speed things up if you just call somebody up and ask them how to get access to their network, or even better, if you can just walk in the front door and plug into the network directly. So organizations pour loads of money into making sure they have the best technical controls. They buy all the latest security products, they commission loads of pen testing, but more often than not, they neglect the human aspect, which as we know, is the weakest link. If you can't go through the firewall, go through the secretary. So what is social engineering? Well, I have spent many years and hours and hours of research uh, looking up very, very trustworthy places to find out what exactly social engineering is. And actually, it was a term coined by a Dutch guy in about 1894 who worked on an industrial plant. And he recognized that to run an industrial plant successfully, you needed to look after the machinery, but you also needed to look after the human element of running the plant. So he decided that you would need mechanical engineers, but you would also need social engineers to look after the, uh, to look after the uh, human aspect of the plant. But a very trustworthy source that I spent ages looking up online tells me that social engineering refers to efforts to influence popular attitudes and social behavior on a large scale, whether by governments or private groups. So originally, it's a term that comes from political science. And therefore, one of the best examples of social engineering that I could find was Second World War propaganda. This is one of my favorite pieces of propaganda, if, if you're allowed to say that you have favorite pieces of propaganda. Uh, so this poster dates back to the Second World War, and it was supposed to discourage American soldiers posted in Britain from picking up good time girls. In, uh, in London and around the UK because there was a great big STD outbreak amongst American GIs that were posted in London. So uh, I'd like to point out that although I live in London, I am in fact Irish. <laughs> but governments still use social engineering today. 
Here's an example from the recent presidential election in the States. And social engineering doesn't always have a negative meaning. Sometimes it's really, really positive. And uh, it can mean influencing social attitudes and behavior in a positive way. And it's not just governments that use social engineering. Every single advertisement that we hear on the radio, we see on TV, we see online, that's a form of social engineering. Anybody recognize these email subjects? You might have received them around, I think, July 2007, when the Storm botnet was at its peak. And the interesting thing about Storm is that it was one of the first pieces of malware that used social engineering. So uh, it used current events to try and trick people into opening the email. We've seen loads of examples of this recently. Particularly this year, we've seen loads of examples of uh, swine flu emails linking to malware. Uh, I know people have seen tons of these. What to do if you, if you suspect you have swine flu, click on it. Too bad for you. And that brings us on to uh, social engineering from an IT security perspective. So uh, Kevin Mitnick, the man who literally wrote the book on social engineering, says that it's techniques hackers use to deceive a trusted computer user within a company into revealing sensitive information or trick an unsuspecting mark into performing actions that create a security hole for them to slip through. So we probably know it as uh, hacking the human firewall. And social engineering is based on the principle that people are the weakest link. So why is that? Why are people the weakest link? Well, it's because people follow instructions. So since we were born, we have been following instructions. We've been obeying our moms and dads. We've been following the instructions of teachers in school. We follow the instructions of policemen and people we think are in authority. Uh, there was an experiment uh, a couple of decades ago now called the Milgram experiment, whereby uh, the volunteers were split in two uh, uh, half the volunteers were hooked up, supposedly hooked up to uh, an electrical voltage, the, a device that administered electrical shocks to them, and the other half of the room were told to uh, keep turning up the voltage. And the guy who was telling them to turn up the voltage had a white coat on, he looked like a scientist. So when he told them to turn up the voltage to something that would actually kill the other half of the room, had it been uh, a real event, they just kept doing it. So people love to follow instructions, which is really convenient for social engineering. We live in uh, a very customer service focused society. People want to help. We speak to call centers where people's job is to help. We speak to reception where people's job is to help. But uh, particularly with call centers, uh, they are measured on, well, they may be measured on how many calls they get through. And to get through calls quickly, what do you do? You get people off the phone by helping them as quickly as you can. Social engineering may work because people are greedy. So uh, what I would like to do is uh, call, call up my target. So yeah, this is, uh, this is Sharon here. I, uh, I'm conducting a survey. And everybody who enters my survey gets entered into a draw to win a trip to Paris, something like this. And if people think there's something in it for them, well, yeah, they give you a information. Uh, you've probably all heard of the passwords for chocolate research that they often do in the run-up to InfoSec in London each year. So they stand outside a busy train station in London and they ask people to swap their passwords for a bar of chocolate. And although the numbers have dropped lately, I think it's gone down to something like 45% of people who swap their passwords for chocolate, uh, they still do it, 45% is still a hell of a lot. And whether or not these people are giving away their true passwords, I don't know. Social engineering works because people do have a tendency to trust other people, which is exploited by social engineers. Uh, and that's a nice society we live in, where people trust each other. And it's very difficult to find that happy medium between a really nice society where people trust everyone and uh, the other extreme where no one trusts anyone uh, in an organization. We've got to find somewhere in the middle where people uh, maybe are a little bit suspicious, particularly of strangers, but it doesn't make it a horrible environment to work in. 
I often find that social engineering 